Jesus says things in the gospel reading that I think there would be plenty of us which would say we wish it wasn't in there. And here's what I mean by that. We live in our culture with a very specific model for success. And that has everything to do more often than not with an accumulation of education, an accumulation of some wealth, and therefore an accumulation of position, right? How do you know a successful person? Well-educated, looks great, well-connected, <coughs> knows people, and has some money to prove it. Not your head, isn't that true? <laughs> now, you see, here's the problem with that, if you're a Christian. That would be one of those people that Jesus would say are wise. In other words, they're smart. They figured out the system, and they know how to get ahead. <laughs> but Jesus says something in the Gospel reading doesn't sound like he thinks a lot of that model is success. Because he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise, meaning the well-connected, the people who have great education, the people who have accomplished something in terms of their social standing. And instead, you have revealed them to whom? Infants or babes. Now, he's not talking about this, people in the grave. He's talking about, in fact, an attitude that we have towards God. And it's very hard. Jesus put it this way. He was so blunt about it. How hard it is for the rich to get into the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than to get through the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> that's another one of those, ooh, but oh really? Particularly, see, if that's the group of people that we emulate, or in fact want to be one. So what's he talking about? What does it mean? How do we get? Here's the thing. All of us have some sense of wanting to be like the people that I described. It's within us. It's really a part of who we are. So how do we get from there to being in a position where we can actually begin to receive God's wisdom? Because if I'm completely committed to being like this model of success, what the, the implication of the scripture is, is that I'm actually cutting myself off from receiving the wisdom from, of God because God doesn't reveal his wisdom to people like me. Hello. In other words, if the focus of my life is accomplishment, then there's going to be something in that goal, that focus, that determination that in fact can actually make it very difficult for me to hear anything from God at all. Now it doesn't help when many of our churches look at the people who are well connected and dressed well and are educated and have some means and literally automatically assume, well those are the people that we need to be going after. Those are the people that we want in our churches because they're people of influence. And since they're people of means, that's going to help our budget, right? Nod your head. Come on, read this one together. <laughs> we're, telling, we're talking the truth here. And yet, if that's the very group of people who because of that determination are literally cutting themselves off from being in a position to be able to receive God's wisdom, if those are the people that we hold up and caught and literally set before our children, as people that we're called to emulate, we are in actually direct conflict at cross purposes with the scripture reading this morning. Hello? <laughs> so what's going on? Here's the answer. First of all, God loves us very, very much. And therefore, he is determined to work something new in us. Knowing all of our ambitions, all of our desires. And he wants to work in us that sense of what it means to be childlike in his presence. How does he do that? That's the Roman 7 lesson. Probably one of the most graphically honest portions of the entire New Testament. Where Paul is writing, what does he say? 
He said, in essence, let me paraphrase. Okay, I actually know what the right thing to do is. And I acknowledge that it's a good thing. That's what he calls the law. The law is good. It's the right thing to do. And you know what? I actually want to do that. I want to do just the very thing that we said in the colleague about. What's the essence of what it means to be a follower? It means to, to love God and to love your neighbor. That's the essence of the law. Jesus taught that, right? On your head, yes. Okay, I want to make sure we're tracking here. And so, and I want to do that. In other words, I'm not one of those people who says, ah, oh, that's for somebody else. No, 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 that's actually in my mind. I've got a commitment to do what I can by God's help to love God and to love my neighbor because I understand that's what's expected of me as a Christian. So, Paul's on board. He said, however, there's something else going on. Even though with my mind, I've made this commitment, there's something else operating inside of me that actually wants to do its best to sabotage my very best efforts. Right? It's what he calls the law of sin and death. In other words, there's that good law that my mind says, I'm there, I want to do it, I'm committed. Love God, love your neighbor. But you know what happens to me? When my desire gets in the way of actually loving God and loving my neighbor, I almost always choose to follow what Paul describes as the law of sin and death. In other words, I'm more than willing to love everybody so long as they don't cross me. <laughs> and then if they cross me, all of a sudden, they're on another list, and it's not my love list. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> Or I'm praying, and I'm working hard to pray, and I'm beseeching God to do something new, and I pray, whether it's for somebody I love to care about, or something that goes on in my life, and I really want God to do it, and so I pray, and I claim every scripture that I can for it to be working and right and all of that, and God says, no. And what happens inside of me is that there's a part of me that kind of closes up on the inside of me. I don't... I don't know that I want to get that close to God if he's not going to do everything that I ask. In other words, and it's those events, the, the I don't know that I love them anymore list that's inside of my heart. Or I'm having a really hard time to forgive them list that's inside of my heart. Or the list that says, you know, if that's the way they're going to treat me, I want nothing to do with them list in my heart. Or the list that I have in my heart as it relates to God when he didn't come through in the way that I actually wanted him to do. And therefore, when those things begin to happen, that literally colludes with the law of sin and death. And the law of sin and death is, I want what I want, no matter what happens. That's the law. That's another way of describing the law of sin and death. So Paul says, in essence, there are all these things operating in me at the same time. There's a part of me that actually really wants to do the right thing. And I, I, I try it, actually. This is what Paul is saying here. But then things happen, and I find that the very thing that I don't want to do, I don't want that resentment. I don't want to close my heart against God. I want to freely forgive other people. I want to do the right thing. But then, bang, something happens to me. The law of sin and death comes over, and there's something inside of me that goes, you're going to treat me that way? No. It's almost before I, I, I can really help myself. It just comes out, and I wind up saying the wrong thing. Isn't that right? In your head, here we are. <laughs> so, and, and if you really, do, and you see, here's, here's the point. The point is, is that God intentionally, hello, intentionally has to bring about circumstances in our lives to show us that even if I get everything I want in terms of education and prestige and influence and all of that, it doesn't answer the sin issue in my heart. That it is, in fact, a false God. Yeah, but it's not so bad if you have plenty of money. No, 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 no. Ask anybody who has money. They'll tell you, the night's just as dark for them as anyone. And it is that struggle 
inside. Between me wanting to do what's right, me discovering that sometimes I just can't, no matter what my will wants, that the law of sin and death is at war with the law that is good in my mind, that literally drives us, if we're willing to be just blunt honest with the struggle. And that's important because we, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Have you seen my new car? In other words, there is a part of me that really wants to act like the law of sin and death struggle is not inside of me. But if we're the body of Christ, that means we need to be honest. That's why I'm saying, nod your head, we're in this one together. We're here. And God is using that struggle to drive us. I mean, drive us to the point where we're willing to finally admit, you know, God, I guess in your sight, even though I work at part of all these things, it doesn't answer the cry of my heart. Paul, I mean, it's this way in Isaiah. Why do you spend your money on that which is not and your labor for that which does not satisfy. And when we begin to cry out to God, because we know that all of our accomplishments doesn't satisfy the need inside, when we finally are willing to admit that all of my outward accomplishments doesn't deal with the darkness that is within my own heart, and all of a sudden as I begin to face up to that, the material plays much, much less a role in my desire. And something new is being kindled in me. And it has everything to do with the desire for a new heart. Far more so than a new void for it. It's at that point that God is actually beginning to work in us. The kind of childlike hunger that opens us up to God's answer to the need that is inside of us. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Now what is that? You know what a yoke is? It's like, here am I. Here's Jesus. We're connected. There's literally a bar of wood across our shoulders that unites us together. We're, we're tied. That's what the yoke is. We're tied together. In other words, Jesus, when you're with me and I want to go here, I want you to pull me back. Yeah. Say, don't go that way. When I'm tempted above everything, go and do the very thing that I don't want to do, I need you to come and break in and do something new in my life. Keep me and protect me, oh God from the desire to go that way rather than your way. That's the yoke. And his point is, is that his yoke, meaning that it is easy, believe me, it is easier to follow Jesus than it is to follow the way of sin and death. The pleasures are out there in that way of sin and death. Otherwise, we wouldn't be attracted to it. But as it says in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction and death. Meaning you can have all of the nice stuff, but it doesn't answer the dark cries that are in your heart. And that matters more to God than everything that you could ever accumulate. Whether that be material, educational, whether that could be influence, you see, God wants to use you in the positions in which you find yourself. But the only way He's going to use you in those very circles that you have tried so hard to get into is for Him to work in you that kind of childlike heart that is willing to yield to Him and not be drawn into that way of sin. You see, God is not anti-world. The answer is not monastic and poverty. There are people that are called to that. But most of us are called to be business people, to work in the world, to earn a living, to take care of our family. The goal is not monasticism and poverty, but the goal is childlike faith in the very circles and places where God has put us 
so that we can be <coughs> responsible to Him for the responsibilities that God has given us. In other words, God wants you to be godly business people, godly educators, godly politicians, godly neighbors, godly people who are involved in hospitality, all of the various things that make this world what it is. God wants you to be there for you, so you can be in that position as salt and as light. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And that's not going to happen so long as you're being seduced by all of that kind of worldly power. Doesn't mean you have to let it go. But what it does mean is, is that you have to say, Jesus, in the place where I am, keep me under your yoke. That I may follow you. So that wherever you are, no matter whomever you are with, be they people of tremendous power in the world, or of little account, you're treating them with great dignity. Because they are all made in the image of God. See, that's God. You're not seduced by the power of God. You know, as they say, suck up. <laughs> you're loving each, just as he or she is. Because that's what God has called you to do. And when you get into the position where you're saying, Oh, I'm paying far too much attention to somebody because I want them to like me or to open a door for me. God shows it to you and you say, Oh, like, okay, Lord, come on, bring this yoke in again. Show me how to actually love and care for this person, whether they know this or not. So that God actually begins to change your heart. And what begins to happen in that moment is you begin to discover the come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, I promise. Because I want to rest in the arms of God wherever I am. Otherwise, you know what's happening? Stress. Physical ailments because of stress. Mental anguish because of stress. Right? Hello? It's exactly the opposite of his easy yoke. And the come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. So, in the midst of all of this, what do you want to do? Are you willing to say, okay, Jesus, I'm willing to face up to the dark inside. I want to find a way to come under your easy yoke. I, want to, I really want to learn what it means to love you and to love my neighbor without all that self-centered stuff inside of me. I have no idea how to do it. I am in this enterprise an infant. See, so babe, I don't know how, but please, I want you, strap me in, put your yoke around me, and begin to teach me how to walk your way where I am. Not to escape out of it, but learn how to live in it in a way that actually causes me in the worst of situations to still know your peace and learning how to care well for people in a way that actually honors you rather than me trying to do it to become a person of more influence. Right? That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This morning, we have that baptism, we have confirmation. We have reaffirmation, all of which are commitments to follow this Jesus. That's what they are. And you will be reaffirming your own commitments to follow Jesus, because that's how the liturgy guides us. In other words, we're doing this together. We're not just watching them. We're saying yes to you, too. And so what I want to say to you this morning, as we come to a thought, as we come to confirmation, that what will happen inside of you is that as you say that we will, that you will say, think about the sermon. God, I will, by your grace, find a way to come under your yoke. I will take that yoke on me. That wherever I am, I might be your man, your world. But I might, in the midst of all that I am, know your rest and your peace, serving you wherever you have put me. Let us pray.
Gracious Lord, we are yours. And we confess to you that more often than not, the dilemma that Paul describes in Romans is more experientially true for us than the easy yoke of the rest. But we say to you, turn the tables. Help us, God, to take on that yoke, to say yes to you, so that wherever we are, we might honor you, and that you might work that within our hearts. Help us boldly to be people who are learning because you are teaching us how to love our neighbors and how to love you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. <coughs> See, now we're doing baptism. And so here's what's going on.